Uh, you know, just talking about tonight and after our new groups have been formed, after the ministry has kind of been split into smaller groups, um, you know, we start thinking about in our lives and in our groups and even personally, hey, what do we want from these groups? You know, what, what goals or dreams do we have or what resolutions do we have for our group? But it got me thinking, why do most people <coughs> wait until the new year to have their new dream or new year's resolution? That's true. Because any moment in any day, you can start to have a new dream. You can start to have a new resolution for your life. And you want to do something different. But people love to wait to change their lives. Yeah. You know, have you ever heard about somebody talking about that diet they're going to start on Monday? Oh, yeah. And then when Monday starts, do you start? they start convincing you that, I wasn't talking about this Monday, I was talking about next Monday. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then they start talking about how it's going to be so different. When that Monday comes, man, you're going to be totally different. It's going to be awesome. You're going to be so disciplined and everything. And usually that conversation is happening right when they're eating a donut, you know, right when they're eating something unhealthy, eating a bowl of ice cream. I can't wait until Monday comes. I, I'm going to be so good with my diet, yep, that's you know, good. and people have this, that they're, they're waiting to change their lives. I think a reason that people are waiting is because the thrill of a new dream or a new year resolution in their life, that's, that's thrilling, that's fun to talk about. But deep down, we like keeping the same and we like staying the same. We like keeping the old self and, and staying the same. That's true. You think about it. When you're moving into a new house, you love the idea. It's actually exciting moving into a new house. But once you get there, do you buy all brand new furniture? Uh, no. You usually bring the same old stuff you had in the old house and bring it in. Why? Because even though we're getting into a new situation in our life, we still love the old. Even for me, I'm kind of like this. I love going to the gym, but the reason I go to the gym is so that I can have my donuts. Yes. You know, so I can yes. eat ice cream. So I can actually still do all these things. That's I mean. love the new, but I still really love the old. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I remember actually in the beginning when I started to go to this gym class, I used to have my friend, he actually came to church once, his name is Jin, and he used to be my competitor. He didn't even know this, but I'm a very competitive person. Oh and every day I'll compete with him. He's on the other side of the room, doesn't even know who I am. And I'm competing with him every day, just like, I'm going to get better, I'm going to get better. But it's been about two months, and I've grown a little bit, and I see this guy still going super fast. He goes to the gym pretty much every single day. Even before our gym class, I just heard out that he goes about an hour early, still doing pull-ups and push-ups and everything. And uh, I quit my competition with him. Because there's something different between us two. He has resolve and has a goal. I'm just doing it for fun. I'm just doing it so I can still have my donuts. There's, there, there is no competition. There's no comparison to our fitness. See, why do people wait until the new year to have a new dream and resolution? Again, they love the thrill, but they're unwilling to change their mold. Wow. I think that, most of all, maybe we just totally misunderstood the word resolution as well. A New Year's goal and dream are common, but there is general no resolve in those that come up with these dreams. To have a resolution means that you are resolved to do whatever it takes to get this done. When someone talks about a New Year's resolution, that's not what they mean. They think, oh, hopefully I'll do this. I'll pray for my resolution. That means you haven't decided in your heart. You are resolved to do it no matter what. See, most resolutions lack execution. That they say they want it, but they're not really doing it. Because a fantasy is fun to envision, but we talk about it as though we think that this is speech, uh, excuse me. We talk about it and how it could be, thinking that this is faithful speech. Meaning we talk about our dream and our vision, but we're not actually doing it. So we think we're being faithful. Wow, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. But you actually are putting it in execution. See, faithfulness is found in action. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. That when the new is coming, we got to get rid of the old and start embracing the new. You know, if you go back to Sydney and go back into one of the households there and go into their garages, I'm pretty sure you can still find a couple of Tegan and I's clothes. Maybe one of our bookshelves, one of our, I, I don't know, whatever it is, I'm pretty sure you can find a couple of our things still there. What are they doing? All they're doing is taking up space. 
There's no point in it. There's something old that all it's doing is taking up space. In the same way, the Bible describes our body as the house of God. The, the house of the Spirit of God. And in this house, there's, all much so, there's only so much space that can fit in. See, we need to be out with the old and in with the new. If you're still having old, dead dreams in your life, you need to get rid of those and start having some new dreams. Mm. See, this new year, this 2019, is supposed to be a year of vision and dreams. Yeah. If you guys don't even remember how we're going into the conference of our, of our uh, Austral China conference, what is the, China, uh, the, the conference called? Living the dream. Yeah. You know, it's getting people, by the end of the year, I'm pretty sure they're just going to ask, did you do what you said you are going to do? Um. Did, were your dreams still alive? Are you still praying about it? Or do you need some new dreams? So my title of my lesson today is simply New Dreams and New Culture. Point number one is this, New Dream and New Resolution. So if you are turning in your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 25, verse 16. But point number one, New Dream, New Resolution. Some of you may be thinking, well, Sean, we already have our Bible talk goals. We already have our dreams for this year. Um, we don't really need a new, new dream. We just need to be focused again. That's it. We just need to get our old dream, polish it up again, and go after it again. But I want you to kind of remember and use this kind of comparison or use this um, way to, to um, what is it, uh, uh, be able to apply it, excuse me, to your dreams is, remember what the Bible says about at least the Word of God. It says, the Word of God is alive and it is active. Well, what does it mean by being alive and active? Well, the Word of God is to be used, otherwise it's not active. The Word of God is to be applied, otherwise it's, it's not alive. So let's apply this same principle to our dreams. If your current dreams are not motivating you every day to action, that means it's not an active dream. If you have not done anything to this point two weeks in in your new groups and your new goals, Congratulations, your dream is not alive. Mm -hmm. And I have nothing to offer you to keep your dream alive because it's already dead. Mm -hmm. Unless we're going to do some Jesus resurrection of your dream, which possibly could happen. But at this point, it's dead. There's nothing you can do. You can't keep something alive when it's already dead. When it's dead in the first place. It's kind of like this idea, and there's this funny uh, kind of article talking about it. It's this idea of don't beat a dead horse. I Meaning, stop trying to get something to move when it's dead. But people love to do that in innovative ways. Of, I don't want to get a new horse, I want to still keep my old horse and try that dead horse and still try to get it to move. Mm. You start, okay, well, what should I do? Maybe I'll buy a, a stronger whip. Ooh. Maybe, maybe I'll just change riders. With a dead horse, maybe I'll just threaten the horse to keep moving. Mm. Maybe I'll appoint a committee to study dead horses and how to get them to move. Huh. Maybe I'll hire professionals to ride my dead horse. I'll harness several dead horses together to increase the dead horse speed. You know, I'll increase dead horse funding to support dead horses. I'll rewrite the expected performance required for all horses. See, all these things, we can be innovative in trying to get our dead dreams to go, but all in all, that dream is dead, we need a new dream. There's a saying, it says, when you discover that you are riding a dead horse, the best strategy is just to dismount. See, in Matthew 25, verse 16, it gives us a snippet of this guy in this parable of when he was receiving something from God, he, his main idea and his main use for this was to put it to work. Yeah. See, in Matthew 5, uh, 25, verse 16, it says, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave Five more bags. See, once he received something from his master, he was out there putting it to work. See, when you read scriptures like the following, are they at work in your life? John 14, verse 12, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. What about scriptures like Matthew 17, 20? Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. What about scriptures like Philippians 4, 13? I can do all this 
through him who gives me strength. What these scriptures are is that God is giving you a real insight into our lives and how he sees that each and every single one of us have potential in our lives to reach greatness. That he has told us to do great things, but yet we still find ourselves believing in a false dream, selling ourselves short, selling ourselves massively short. He has given us a dream and a vision for this world. And the main thing we have to ask ourselves, hey, is it at work in you? It's not about just us doing it, right? Because in no way can we do this by ourselves. Philippians 4.13 tells us we can do all things through him who gives us strength. Even when Jesus was working here on the earth, he says here in John 5.17, In his events, Jesus said to me, My father is always at, excuse me, always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. That Jesus was motivated because he knows that God the Father had was, was working all the time. He's like, therefore, I am working. See, when it talks about this, even in our own lives, as the old has gone and the new has come, it talks about how life is at work in us. 2 Corinthians 4.12 So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. That they were dying to themselves so that life can start working in us. So talking about this and realizing that, hey, if your dreams and your goals or whatever you have that has not been putting you to action, then you've got to really face it like, Wow, you've you got to get new dreams. Because dead dreams are very dangerous. Because they have the same effect on our hearts as would a lukewarm relationship with God. It's the same effect. See, it talks about here when in Revelations, when it uh, warned them about their lukewarmness, it says this about them. Revelations 3, 15 through 17. I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, but I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, the thing with here, he was warning them of why lukewarmness was so dangerous in their life. is because they don't realize that they are in need. That they need something new, that they need a change. At least cold people need, know that they need it, but they don't want it. They've made that decision. But someone who's lukewarm is like, hey, I'm, I'm okay with where I'm at. And it's the same thing that dead dreams can do with us. We don't realize that we're just playing games with ourselves. We're telling ourselves, well, at least I have a dream. At least I have a goal. Well, it is worse having a dead dream than having no dream at all at this point, reading this scripture. Because it's taking up space in your heart. That you're putting yourselves and you're putting yourself in a position to have hope deferred. That you're saying, hey, I want these things, but you're not really pushing yourself to get them. So therefore, it's probably not going to happen. And then you're going to get disappointed. Then you're going to think dreams don't work or goals don't work. And you're going to blame that rather than looking at yourself and saying, well, this, I was never motivated to get this dream in the first place. Maybe I should have just changed right in the beginning and get a live horse. See, people make dreams like they're kind of having an eye test. When I'm talking about dreams here... Um, people will kind of think this way. Have you ever been in a D time where they're asking your questions and you're just thinking, man, what do they want from me? You know, what answer do they want? You're just kind of looking at them like, what exactly do you want me to say? But sometimes the disciples is kind of looking at them saying, not what do I want? What do you want from yourself? Yeah. That's what disciples are trying to figure out. What do you want from yourself? And I'm going to help you with that. Yeah. But it's kind of like this. See, people show up to these D times or even groups Kind of like how people show up to eye exams. So have you ever been in an eye exam where they have the letters on the wall? You know, you get the big E. Everyone feels good about that. We can all get hit that. That's awesome. We all feel good about ourselves. And then it gets smaller, 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 and smaller. What the point of that is, is that when you reach something that you don't really know what it is, you talk to the person and say, hey, this is why I'm here. I know I have bad vision. I don't know what the heck that letter is. But, hey, give me some glasses that can help me see that letter. Do we do that? No, none of us do that. We squint. And we try to <laughs> lean forward. Oh. And we guess the letter. Is, uh, is it a D? <laughs> you know? Like, that's going to help us at all. Like, we want to go throughout our life. Well, now i figured it out. All if I do, if I just squint and wow. look forward the whole entire time, I can see that. There's no point. Wow. That's kind of the same thing people are doing is get a dream. And you're looking at your disciple. What does he want me to do? What is that? Mm. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you, what do you want from your mm. life? Come on, Sean. If you need help finding a dream, okay, ask me. 
I'll tell you where's a good place that I think you can go. But other than that, find something that you are excited about, guys. Yeah. See, scriptures are kind of like your faith glasses. It still surprises me. I, I, I don't wear glasses, but it still surprises me. Those who need to wear glasses but don't wear glasses? Mm. It surprises me all the time. To be honest, I, I think most of us, if we had to have a vote, you know, is seeing a good thing in life, most of us would raise our land. But for some reason, we still live our life for those that need wearing glasses and they don't. They're like, you know, I'm just going to decide not to see today. I don't care what's in front of me. Like, I, I don't understand. And it's the same way. If you want to see real dreams and real vision in your life, Come on, Ashley. then Let's go. you need the scriptures. <laughs> You're not going to be able to see these visions and dreams for yourself by looking at your own self and thinking how you're going to do it. You need these scriptures that I just, I just messaged. Philippians 4.13, you can do everything. Man, start looking at your life through that, through that vision. Look, and kind of like an eye exam. Have you ever went to the eye exam and uh, they cover one eye and they show you one lens, show you the second lens? Yeah. Okay, which one's better? Yeah. And they look exactly the same? Yeah. <laughs> That's almost kind of like scriptures and we wish it wouldn't be. We look at scriptures and they show us the same vision of ourselves that we can do greatness. Looks the same in your life. Um, sorry God, do you have any mediocre scriptures? Is there anything that, hey, I, I can pass on by and it'll be okay? Wow. Most of us wish there were scriptures like that. We wish that we weren't always called to greatness, but that's not it. The visions are the same. It's showing us the same exact thing. Yeah. That we are called to greatness. See, for some of us, we need to revalue our dreams. Does your dream give you motivation, action, and make you want to come up with a plan? If not, then you're working with a dead dream. Dream for your families. If some of us have dreams for our families or close friends to be Christians, but we never pers persistently invite them to church or even try to talk about the Bible, it's labeled a dead dream. If we want leadership and we have the dream to become a Bible talk leader, evangelist or even just seeing in the church but not eagerly going out to serve during the Bible talk or we're not connecting our actions with that certain vision again it's a dead dream mm. if we want to go on a mission team if we want to do something bigger but yet we're not saving up money for a mission team if we don't express it if we don't fight for it it's a dead dream if we want to go on dating we want to be dating mm. and yet we're, we're not humble to advice we're not going on Date, uh, kingdom dates, we're not reaching out to people that are advising, it's a dead dream. Mm -hmm. See, get a new dream that brings you resolution. Find a dream that gives you passion, motivation, action, and a plan. And my question to you is simply, what do you want? Who do you want to baptize? See, baptism is kind of like the E, that big letter. We show up and it's like, hey, what do you want? I want to baptize them. Oh, awesome, you got the first letter. Okay, let's go down. Who do you want to baptize? Oh, I didn't think about that. What do you mean? What's their age? Are you okay with being the only Samoan here, Timoteo? You know, let, let, let's get some other people. You know, what, what, who do you actually want to baptize? Who do you see coming into the church? Okay, well, what leadership role do you want to fulfill? People always talk about, you know, only evangelists or women's ministry. There's so many other ways to serve, guys. Yeah. What, what, what do you want to do? What does a dream life look to you? and plan backwards from there. See, my first challenge is find out what you want. If you don't know what you want, get help for your vision. But stop saying, I don't know. That's, that's not gonna get you anywhere. That's not helping you and it's not helping anyone to actually direct you in your life. Come on. Be courageous enough to be wrong in your dream at least. At least you're aiming for something with all your heart. See, point number one, we need a new dream that's bringing us resolution. And with this comes kind of point number two, creating a biblical culture. This is not just for leaders to hear, but all of us in each one of our ministries is always building something. See, when we are part of our group, we are part of that ministry. We're part of that body. We're part of that kind of building of Christ right there. Meaning if you're coming in and you're having laziness, you're building laziness into the group. If you're coming in with, with criticalness on your heart, you're building criticalness into the group. You're, you're always building something. And now we have to look into here, okay, not only are we building a dream in our lives, how are we going to make our groups a group of dreamers? See, see, excuse me, it says here in Ephesians 4, verse 11, it talks about here that we don't only just grow individually, but we grow together. In Ephesians 4, 11, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, 
to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until that we reach unity in a faith, so that's Ephesians 4.11, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, it says here that we don't just build ourselves or grow up individually, but it says here we need to grow up as a kingdom of God. In the same way, we need to start looking at our Bible talk and even our church in whole as, hey, we need to grow together. Yeah. So, how do we grow together? How do we build this type of culture? We're going to go through a couple different things of how we can build this type of dream life into our groups. First of all, we need to build a culture of reading the Bible. If you want to grow together, then you must train together. And there is no better trainer than the Word of God. So how do we train together? We know that they were devoted to the apostles' teachings, but I just wrote some small practicals on getting you thinking of how can you build in your Bible talks a culture that you guys are in the Bible together. Maybe you read a chapter of a book a week, and you have a Bible discussion based off that chapter. And everybody can kind of add what they got from it. You can even send the Bible talk leader different questions that they can add during the discussion. That could be a cool way that you guys are all excited about this upcoming Bible talk. Maybe you can read a spiritual book together. I know there's a great book that kind of we sent uh, to our friend Oates of More Than a Carpenter, Building Faith into a Group. You know, maybe you can have a theme each week where each person in the Bible talk shares their favorite scripture on that theme. Give you an example. So meaning that if your theme for this week was faith, then by the end of the week, everyone shares, hey, what was your favorite scripture that gives you the most faith? That's cool. Next week, it could be love. What's a scripture that helps you feel the unconditional love of God? There's so many different practicals, but start building a culture in your small Bible talks of reading the Bible. A culture of prayer. See, there's an individualism that sometimes we fail to address when it comes to prayer. Throughout the Bible, it was always talking about that they prayed together. Acts 1.14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Acts 2.42, uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, like we just said. To the fellowship, we're always around each other, but to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Guys, we need to build a culture of prayer in our groups to build up our dreams. See, this is a spiritual connection that we need to have with each other. We're not just called to be good friends or see each other every couple of days, but we are called to be brothers and sisters in Christ, to have a spiritual connection with each other. So, different practicals on praying with each other. Um, have a prayer dream list for your group. Have you come up a prayer list for your Bible talks? Pray with one new person a week in a group. Be mindful, again, of, of brothers and sisters and not just being alone with a sister or alone with a brother. So just be mindful of that. And uh, pray for everyone in your group. You know, it helps you to, to actually think more about your Bible discussions. If you're actually praying for these people, what do they want? What are their goals? You know, getting them to pray for you. And obviously, there's a lot more that you can add into that as well. Um, we need to have a culture of confession. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know, we must learn to confess our sins daily and build a bond between each other. You know, I know that this is something that actually I kind of um, heard from Dean maybe about like a month ago or two months ago. Um, they were kind of slow in the ministry and he's like, Hey, I, I don't really know what we need to do, but I know there's one thing that God always blesses and that's righteousness and us just having a pure heart from him. Let's just every single night as brothers and the sisters can do it separately, but every single night we're going to get together as brothers and we're going to pray for each other's sin. And all we're going to do is confess, pray and go home. And it, it was also, that was one of the most fruitful times in the Hong Kong church oh. and they just got together. Uh, yes, they went sharing, but afterwards they confessed, they prayed for their sins, and went home. He was like, man, we had such deep relationships when that, that, when that was around. And even now he's thinking, maybe I need to do that again. That was awesome when we were all around. So again, practicals for this. Um, learn to ask questions daily about their struggles. You know, don't just wait for people to confess to you. Learn, hey, if this uh, brother X has a particular struggle, remind, re remember to ask him about that. You know, ask them on a daily thing. Hey, how's it going? I've been praying for you. How's it going? Oh, I struggled a little bit today. Well, that's awesome, man. Struggling means at least you're fighting. Don't give in, bro. Yeah. Like, awesome. Don't let confession stop short of repentance. Follow up with help and love. Mm -hmm. So even when people are confessing, have that goal. is like not, oh, yeah, we confess, we pray. That's awesome. It's like, okay, we'll continue on. Um, if they're struggling with something, like, okay, hey, 
I pray for you this texting them in the morning. Hey, I'm praying for your struggle. Um, uh, I, 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 let me know if you're struggling today. Call me anytime, even though I'm at work. Whatever it is, right? Helping them actually to get to repentance. And then confess, excuse me, confess and pray with each other, maybe at least 10 minutes at, at night. Put at least 10 minutes away at night that you're at least going to go to somebody like, hey, usually this is my time of confession. Even if you had nothing on your heart, like I just want to say, hey, today was a pretty good day. I fought my struggles. It was awesome. Mm. But most of us, we always have that extra little bit at night. But how about we use just 10 minutes of it just to have that opportunity to get our hearts um, right with God as well as building those deeper relationships. And my last thing about building a biblical culture is building a culture of trusting and supporting. Looking at two different scriptures that I believe kind of really hones into this type of relationship in the church is Proverbs 27 verse 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18 says, just as, just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit as in form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. But if the foot should say, because I, am a, excuse me, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed... Um, the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. It's looking at this of building a culture of trust, support, and building each other up. Is that looking at it in our groups in a biblical way rather than, oh, hey, this is what Joe advised or Sean or Tegan came up with in building these new groups. No. It says here that God, at the end, he was sovereign and he wanted these groups exactly how he put it together. And that they were all to be built up together. And see, when one part was hurting, that's, that's why there, there was people around it so it can help that person. It's kind of like, have you ever had something hurting in your body and that affects your whole body? Mm. It's kind of like me whenever I have a headache. I am done. I am out on the couch. It's over. Mm. But it's like when, 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 when everything's working together, your, your whole body is okay. It's awesome. Yeah. But whenever this feels a little bit of pain, your whole body feels. And that's how we should be connected in Christ as well. You know, not giving up and letting other people be unspiritually, excuse me, um, giving up and letting people be unspiritual in our group is just not acceptable. We, we can't accept that. Not that we have a higher standard or anything, but to help get into their lives. Most of us don't want to be unspiritual, but we are. Most of us don't like to fight against our emotions, but we're extremely emotional. We need people around us where we can feel in our group that, hey, it's awesome. I have this Bible talk because I trust the people around me. Yeah. So I just really want to encourage to get back onto this as well, is that in our groups, it's not just a little Ian and Margot, that there's a reason that God has even you two together. Start building a, a Bible talk for you guys, even for Tyrone and Ashley. Um, start building goals and, and, and what you guys want from your little group as well. Yeah. See, at the end of this, we need to help each other to get back onto our goals, make some live goals where we are have a new resolution to go after them and be resolved to attack them. See, once we do this and we just get these new goals, this new culture, that not, we're not going to be dealing with dead horses and wondering why we're not going anywhere. Get our new horses, start going and start living the dream that God is calling us. So when we show up to that conference, we can all say, we are living the dream, help me live it more. And that's my lesson tonight. Awesome, guys. I'd like to open up for just a, a time of sharing and see what you guys